Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Goldmouth Action Podcast, where we take a look at all the latest goings on at Brighton and Hope Albion. Uh, I'm Darren Howard, and this week I'm joined by Brighton experts Sam Morton and Henry Bryant. Uh, Brighton drew 1-1 and then lost 2-1 at home to Chelsea since we last spoke. Uh, Sam and Henry at both games, and you can read all of the stories we're talking about with videos and pictures online at sussexworld.co.uk. You can check out other great videos on shotstv.com and Freeview Channel 276. You may also be watching on Latest TV, so thank you very much for um, for tuning in. But um, we'll start with the uh, with the Brighton uh, and their game against uh, Chelsea, Sam. You're at the Amex uh, Stadium, as, as we mentioned. And uh, after De Zerbe's comments about trying to sign uh, Cole Palmer uh, in his press conference, uh, it just had to be him, didn't it, really, that opened the, opened the scoring for, for Chelsea? Yeah, it had to be him. It felt inevitable that um, he'd be the one to open the scoring for, um, for Chelsea. Obviously, they've had a really um, significant upturn in form, Chelsea, and they've obviously stayed a, um, a claim now for, for the European spots, which seemed... Impossible only just a few weeks ago, yeah. but they've obviously put, yeah. put a run of wins together now, and and that's obviously been spearheaded by Cole Palmer, who's just been exceptional um, this season. And there was a point when he like he might get the, the golden boot, but Harland has obviously um, has turned it on, turned on the style in recent weeks with them um, with quite a few goals. But that doesn't take anything away from Palmer, and we just saw again the quality that he has, and just a brilliant header. And we haven't been used to seeing headers from him, but it's just another obviously skill in his locker that he um he decided to unlock against Brighton um and left for Bruggen with absolutely no chance um with the goal. Um it was a yeah it was, it was obviously a, a very entertaining game. Me and Henry both agreed that it was it was one which um was obviously really end to end and Brighton had the chances um often took too long to shoot which was a bit of a problem for Brighton and, and Chelsea were definitely more more clinical when they when they had the, the opportunities. But obviously, as we'll get into, VAR was obviously um, very much involved in the game after the news that it could be scrapped next season. And it did really take centre stage with a number of different incidents. Um, obviously, had a penalty shout early on in the game when Mark Kukurea was taken, or seemingly taken down by Buonanotte. Um, but actually showed Buonanotte had a touch on the ball. So that, that was correctly not given as a penalty. Um, but in the second half, Brighton should have had their own penalty, um, in all honesty. Um, with Simon and Inga being tripped by Gusto. I'm not, Gusto. I'm not really sure why it wasn't looked at by VER at all. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was it was one of those games really that, that Brighton could have got something from on another day, um, but I suppose they weren't really clinical enough. And when they eventually got that goal uh, from Welbeck at the end, they were already two 0 down. It was a bit little, little, too little, too late in the end, really. Yeah, yeah. No, it seemed that way, but. All right. Well, let, let's get into it then, Henry. Where where do you stand on the uh, on the VAR uh, issue um, that's been coming up? Obviously, there's talk that there's fourteen um, that the, or the Premier League needs fourteen votes from the club to uh, to get rid of it, and the, the clubs are set to have a vote at their upcoming AGM uh, where they all get together. Um, what do you what do you think about all that, Henry? Well, I think if they went back on it now, it would look very very silly, and I think maybe just working to improve VAR would be the better decision because I think we have seen in other competitions it work quite well. Um, so I think the Premier League is a little bit um, lacking sort of the intensity and the sort of pace that VAR needs to be at for it to be not just enjoyable for the fans, but also just, um, you know, efficient for players and for managers yeah. who, are, who are panicking, thinking, it will this be a penalty, a red card, you know, a, a goal? Um, and I think that it would be quite hard to get 14 teams to side with which looks to be Wolverhampton that have um you know issued this um in the first place so it will be it'll be interesting to see if uh, anything does come of it but I'd be very surprised if the VAR was scrapped for next season I think that it's a useful part of the game because I think the technology is so advanced now and it's maybe something to do with the efficiency maybe in the back rooms of this footage and how it's actually used to draw the lines because I think there's been issues with drawing the lines for offsides for you know quite a number of seasons that VAR has been in place um, but maybe having a rethink and maybe making it more efficient instead of scrapping it might be the best way forward. Yeah I, I absolutely I agree with that I think it's it's going to be tough to, to go back just to having one man in the middle making all of the decisions when the game is is so fast and my, my thought on it as well is if you just go back to having the referee, the technology is still going to be there. 
and you want to yeah. you want to make it good for the people in the stadium but still most people do watch the games on tv and the referees are going to be making mistakes the tv are going to have the technology aren't they still and be pouring over it in the studio and then saying well why wasn't this given we've got we can see that this wasn't a goal or this was a goal and it just exactly. seems odd that that technology is there to make it better but they're just not using it in the right way um what, what do you think sam yeah, I completely agree with, with both of um, your points there, really. I think we saw it last night, um, really, that it's just the two different sides of it. We saw it work perfectly um, with showing that the penalty against Brighton wasn't and that it, it was used in, in a good way. But then they failed to do the same thing again in the second half when it was quite clear that Dingra was fouled um, and it didn't it didn't show up as being um, a penalty. I don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand how that, how that works and why um, the referee wasn't told to go and check the monitor. Like he again was later in the game to decide that Reese James should be should be sent off um, for violent conduct. So I think that's the frustration. It's just the inconsistency with it. Um, and I think yeah, I totally agree that I, I think scrapping it entirely probably isn't the right move, and it probably wouldn't solve many problems because you're still going to no. get those those errors that the referees are making regardless of whether there's technology or not. Um, so I think yeah, I did I did a story um, on the website yesterday, obviously looking back at the service comments in, in the um, in the season about VAR. Um, and he said it seems to work in every other country, but it's just England where um, you're not really sure if the, if the decision made is correct. And obviously he doubled down on that. And he, again, he, yeah, see, how he, yeah. he doesn't like referees and um, he doesn't <laughs> like the referee after the game yesterday. So he's not one to hide his feelings, is to serve um, And understandably so. I think it was um, a real frustrating one that and it could have, it could have changed the game really. It was 1-0 at yeah. the time, right at the beginning of the second half, got that penalty, then it's a different game. So... Yeah, frustrating, and you just hope that I think yeah if they improve VR rather than scrap it um, and make sure they're using it in the right way. So it can only be a good thing. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, Deserby will probably get another fine for that, wouldn't he, Henry? Do you think those comments yesterday or? Well, he was he was almost sort of going, I don't want to talk about it, but and then saying <laughs> what he actually thought. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if they actually do end up finding him for that because he, he sort of tried to not say too much, but he did say um, in quite a, you know, in quite a academic way for, for the way he likes to showcase his feelings. He said, I don't like the way that the game was run um, and, and managed um, in a sense. So I think maybe the fact that he's not deliberately said, I don't like the referee uh, might sort of do him favours because he just said that he didn't like the way the game was run. And I think, we sort of know what he means, but he's not personally attacking anyone, I don't think, in that situation. But yeah, he was um, very frustrated and he said it was a clear penalty um, despite his team score, um, conceding two um, bad goals, he said. Um, and I think he also was mentioning the fact that in terms of the refereeing, there was a, a lack of consistency as well with the, res the uh, outcomes, as Sam was mentioning there. And um, yeah, it was just a shame to see that Brighton weren't able to sort of break through. And when we when we did actually get the goal from Welbeck and a nice assist from João Pedro, it was just a bit too little too late, to be honest with yeah. you. Uh, and before that goal had went in, uh, Sam and I had had a look and it had only been one shot on target for the Albion at that point, which was, you know, only, only about 10 or so minutes to go of, of normal time. Um, so it was um, interesting to see that Brighton weren't able to get their shots off early. And maybe if they had got their shots off early or they had had a penalty decision awarded to them from the Gusto challenge on a Dingra, then, yeah, like Sam was saying, the game could have been completely different and we could have been talking about an emphatic Brighton win or a, a hard-fought draw because it did feel like Brighton did deserve a bit more out of that game. Yeah, there was yeah. two opportunities, weren't there? I think um, Pascal Gross had one uh, from point blank range. And Tarek Lamptey put in a really good cross. I think it was his third brilliant cross into the box. Um, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, Jao yeah. Pedro hit the crossbar from one of them. Um, and there was, I think there's another one that, that fell to um, Adingra and he put just wide. And then the third one was when he came to cross it into Pascal Gross. And you think, I think the fans were celebrating. They thought it was in. And he, yeah. he managed to, to squeeze the ball wide. Um, and obviously, we saw Adingra hit the post. Um, in, in the last five minutes. So, yeah, there definitely were chances for Brighton. Um, and you just felt like if they hadn't had have got that goal earlier, they could have then gone on to, to draw or even win the game. But I just felt that when they finally put the ball in the back of the net, uh, I think they only had about three minutes left of injury time to try and find that equaliser. So, yeah, frustrating in that sense because they certainly had the chances and they, I didn't think they played too badly at all. Yeah, 
Yeah. How, how do you think that so they go into the Man United game and they can still get a top half finish if um, if you know if other results go their way? Um, is that a good season, Henry? When you sort of on balance, do you think Deserby's done a good job to get them top ten, last sixteen Europa League, last sixteen of the FA Cup as well, and all the injuries they've had, um, losing Caicedo, losing McAllister, not getting Carl Palmer, not getting Dewsbury Hall as well. He, he's done a good job, hasn't he, to, to do that? I think he has. I think for casual football fans, they might go and look at it as a table comparison from last season to this season and think, hold on, actually, he's not done a good job. But like you say, the injuries that have occurred for Brighton, the, the sheer amount we've had, and also the sort of opportunities we've given to younger players that have been able to shine, like Jack Kinshawood, for yeah. example, um, you know, that's a risk that Deserby's had to take. Um, and, you know, it's not worked for some players, like, for example, example O'Mahony, sort of when he played and started for Bournemouth, he didn't have the best game in that respect. But for some of the younger players, like I say, it was, you know, a risk worth taking and including the fact that we got into the, you know, round of 16 in the Europa League. It's just been absolutely fantastic. And I think if we can get into that top 10 finish, it would be something that Brighton fans and Brighton players and managers and staff can all think, all right, we've done well, let's regroup, let's try and yeah. get some more players in, let's um, use some of that Caicedo money to good use and uh, regroup and aim for Europe next season. Yeah, that's got to be the aim, isn't it? Well, yeah. thanks uh, thanks for that. Join us after the break and we'll be talking about all things uh, all things Manchester United and uh, and a look ahead to uh, to what Brighton squad may look like next uh, next season. Okay, thanks uh, thanks again for joining us. Um, we're going to go to to Sam Morton now. Um, Sam, as a Man United fan and a Brighton uh, Brighton reporter, you'll be uh, you'll be keeping a, keeping an eye on this uh, this game coming up. Um, how, how do you think uh, how do you think this one uh, this one could play out at the Amex on Sunday? Yeah, really tough one to predict actually, Darren, because um, yeah, Man United themselves are just. Um, a box of chocolates, really. I think you never really know yeah. how, what team's going to turn up. I, I certainly wasn't expecting them to um, get a result against Newcastle um, last night. Because obviously, as we mentioned before, we saw Brighton play at James's Park um, um, the other day, and Newcastle performed really well in that game. It was really end to end, and um, you felt there's more kind of it's a solid grounding there with Newcastle and they're starting to score some more goals in, of late. And I, yeah, certainly wasn't expecting uh, Man United to come out with them with the win, with the problems they've been having lately. Um, so yeah, they, they surprised me there. And I think coming into the game against, against Brighton, Man United have to win to um, get a, at least a conference league place. Yeah. Um, obviously if they win the FA Cup final, then they get into the Europa League. Um, so yeah, so they'll definitely be be up for it and looking to to end the season on a high. Um, whereas Brighton, as I said, the only really aim they have is to is to finish in that um, top ten, as uh, Europe is now um, out of the question, unfortunately for Brighton. So yeah, it's a difficult one. I think a difficult one to predict in that sense. Maybe the pressure might be off Brighton a little bit, and they can just go and express themselves. Because as we've seen, Brighton have improved the form significantly I think it started with that win against Aston yeah. Villa which they followed up with another positive performance at Newcastle um, and even even against Chelsea I thought they played well so they um, were better weren't they like, 100% yeah because yeah, they, they looked like they were really kind of ending the season on a whimper before that um, Aston Villa game so it's really good they've managed to pick themselves up despite all the injuries obviously we saw Lewis Dunk go off um, last night so um, time will tell if he'll be available to, to play against um, Man United um, but yeah, last game of the season. I think the pressure is completely off for Brighton now, and just to try and um, try and give the fans something to celebrate at the end of the season. As we know, they've had a really good record against Man United in recent yeah, seasons. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see if that if that continues. Um, Danny Welbeck, of course, will be looking to get another goal against his former club. He's had a few of those. Um, so yeah, um, new yeah. contract, new contract for Danny Welbeck, wasn't it? New contract, yeah. I'm delighted to see that he's got uh, signed a new contract. Really, it's, um, it's a real coup that because you need that level of experience. And as we've seen this season, um, with the injuries and everything, he's been so crucial um, in stepping in when Jao Pedro has not been there, for example. Um, and it was quite telling that um, De Serbi did say the other day that, in hindsight, he's regretted letting Dennis in Dev leave. Um, but it, yeah. it is only hindsight because he never could have foreseen the number of injuries they've had in those positions yeah. um, this season. Um, 
So yeah, I think they'll definitely be looking to bolster their attacking ranks in um, in the transfer window. But managing to keep hold of Welbeck is really good, uh, really good for the club and keep that experience around. Yeah, yeah. So Welbeck stays, Milner stays, but Lalana goes. Henry, how would you assess Lalana's uh, contribution over the last few seasons? Well, I think that he's been a player that has allowed younger uh, players you know, to have experience. He's also been a cool head in the dressing room, I can imagine, especially with Brighton's first campaign in Europe. And I think that having those older, sort of more experienced heads in the changing room must pay dividends, especially when we had that first match where we lost out to Ike Athens um, in the first sort of Europa League group stage match that we had, uh, where a lot of fans and maybe even players are thinking, oh no, what's going on here? Um, oh, are we going to really struggle? Um, and we ended up you know, top in the group, which was absolutely fantastic. So I think his contribution must have been um, something of, you know, something of a mentality boost for sure. Um, and just the way he's been able to play for Brighton, he's been able to sort of sit in that midfield, either deep or sort of pushing up and and just provide, you know, useful options for attackers and, and wingers, but also able to defend. And he's been I'd say he's been sort of a workhorse as well as sort of the likes of Pascal Gross in sort of that midfield area. And it's been nice to see that we've been able to sort of, you know, get a little bit out of him and get some good use out of him because I think he's a, he's been a great player throughout his career. And um, for him to have had, you know, a little bit of a, a shining light here and, you know, sort of helping us out in probably one of our most important uh, seasons, uh, you yeah. know, in the club's history has been it's been fantastic as well and hopefully whatever he's doing whether that's playing or coaching um he'll you know he'll succeed yeah yeah James Milner, sam are you happy he's staying another year absolutely yeah no so that's really really great news as well i think because his um injury came at quite a bad time for, um, for brighton i think when they've had lots of injuries and his versatility could have been a huge yeah. boost um in those positions um really all over the pitch really um so it's a shame yeah, to that lose him and hinge that was uh that yeah was a blow, wasn't it? both similar positions yeah big blow big blow yeah obviously you talk about the solid march and Karen matoma being big ones and obviously jao pedro being out for those yeah. crucial european games but Kind of the unsung heroes like Hinshaw and Milner not being there um, absolutely um, can make um, such a big difference in those kind of games when they're coming thick and fast and can um, provide that versus versatility that that um, teams need really. So yeah, big shame that they've lost these these players at crucial times in the season. And I think when you weigh up everything like that, you can just there are so many factors as to why Brighton haven't finished maybe as highly as they would have liked. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, absolutely, and really pleased that Milner is there for another season uh, keep him around for his experience and hopefully he can play some more football next season as well yeah yeah no it's key to have that experience and pascal gross he's another one who's who's you know player of the year fans player of the year um there has been some talk that i i'm trek frankfurt are, are very keen to to bring him over um pascal gross has previously spoken that he would like to play in the bundesliga again before his career is finished and also perhaps move back to germany um for, for family reasons um, I think after losing Lalana, De Zerbi will be doing all he can, won't he, uh, Henry, to try and keep Pascal Gross there for another season. I think he's got a year left on his contract uh, this summer. I think if we lose Pascal Gross, then we are really going to have to dig deep in the transfer window and yeah. get yeah. a couple of really you know, high-quality, experienced Premier League pedigree midfielders because Pascal Gross, he's been there um, you know, since our first season in the Premier League and was actually one of our first signings uh, it was from Stuttgart. And when he came in, he was also there with Marcus Suttner as well. Um, and for him, he's just been absolutely quality for the Albion and his contribution is sometimes, you know, overshadowed because he's just not you know, not one of the sort of stars like the likes of Jao Pedro and, and so on and so forth. But he really has been a major benefit to the Albion and just the way he's been able to play these few seasons has has been quality and in the in the you know in a fan's perspective I think that just watching him he's always been the player to be positive and get the ball rolling for the Albion even when the Albion lost out to Bournemouth in quite a devastating fashion a few weeks back Pascal Gross when I went down to watch was always trying to be positive with the ball and always yeah. attacking and always making sure that 
uh, Brighton were getting up the pitch in any way, shape or form. So for the Albion to lose such a important and integral player um, at the moment and in this sort of situation where you've got the likes of Lalana that will be leaving um, and, you know, who knows who else will be leaving in the transfer window as well for the Albion. It just shows that we do really need him to stay at the club. Yeah, for one more season, that would be fantastic. And yeah. like you see, it's, um, it's his personal reasons, but um, let's hope that he is able to stay for that final season because fans love him, uh, De Zerbi loves him, and uh, let's let's see. Yeah, yeah, I hope he does stay. I, I think this season he, he's held that midfield together, hasn't he, with... with um... Uh, Caicedo and McAllister leaving. He's he's been absolutely key in in that midfield. But um, um, and he always scores against Man United as well. So hopefully he'll get a goal against Man United again as well. But um, but Sam, you were speaking to Bart Verbruggen. You were saying after the uh, after the match uh, yesterday, and that's an interesting situation, the goalkeeping situation at Brighton. With uh, you got Bart Verbruggen, Jason Steele, and then Carl Rushworth, who's had a brilliant season at Swansea. Uh, tipped as a future England international, and then James Beadle as well. That goalkeeping situation, they got Kel Sherpin on loan as, as well, who'll be coming back uh, in the summer. Um, there's lots to ponder there, isn't there? If Carl Rushworth steps up, what does that mean for Jason Steele? And, you know, does Carl Rushworth potentially go out on another loan? Or it's it's a tricky one. He looks ready to be in the Premier League now, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, definitely a tricky one. I suppose it's a, it's a positive headache, I guess, for Deserve to have those options yeah. and to maybe um, assess them in maybe pre-season training to see how they're doing. So obviously the, the goalkeeper situation at Bryson is quite a unique one, isn't it? I think uh, for much of the season, he's been rotating still. And mm, yeah. it's only really in recent weeks that he has seemingly decided to stick with Verbruggen on a more regular basis, um, which I, I certainly think has helped. I think that's given the team a little bit more, um, it's solidified things really. You kind of, you kind of know, what to, know what to expect from, from your goalkeeper and the defence has benefited um, absolutely from that. Because I think, yeah, I've, I've, I've spoken during the season, I don't think changing them each week has, has really helped um, matters really. Um, so no, yeah, pleased to see Verbruggen's getting more minutes and he's a quality keeper. Um, he made an absolutely superb save, or a couple of good superb saves, particularly the one um, it was Gusto that lined up a shot from long distance and it took a, a big deflection of Igor and it looked like it was dipping in over for Bruggen and he, it was a superb reaction save. Um, so yeah, I think going into next season, he will, I'm sure, will remain the number one. Um, but as you say, um, these young keepers coming up it, um, into the ranks, and Serbia, will, I'm sure, would love to uh, assess them and see how they can come into the fold and maybe test for Bruggen. But yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see maybe Jason Steele um, maybe leave the club, maybe towards maybe next season, or to see how um, how how it progresses with those with those players um, as well. So. Yeah, big question to answer anyway in the summer for 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 Brighton and how they're going to progress that that goalkeeper position. Yeah, yeah. What do you think, Henry? Just quickly on Steele because he is experienced, isn't he? And to have two young goalkeepers, Rushworth and Verbruggen, that's a bit of a gamble, isn't it? Whereas, whereas Steele offers the you know that experience. Absolutely. There's been a few rumours going around with some sources saying that if Ramsdale leaves Arsenal potentially to go to Newcastle, that Arsenal will be looking for a homegrown goalkeeper to fit into their squad sort of as a backup keeper. And they've they've had a look at Jason Steele um, and they might even approach him in the summer transfer window. But like you said, having... Oh, wow. I didn't hear that one. Yeah. Having an experienced keeper, um, having an experienced keeper like him would be of massive interest to, to Brighton for, you know, having their younger players learn off such a important sort of experienced goalkeeper and I think that having that mix that we already have in a lot of positions of experience of you know defence midfield and attack of young and old um is is really key yeah 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 no it'd be an interesting situation see how that see how that one pans uh, pans out and just quickly Man United this Sunday at the Amex final game of the season what's the score going to be Sam I'm going to go for a draw in this one I'm going to go for yeah one all one all draw um, that doesn't really help Man United in their quest for Europe. And um, yeah, not a bad way to win the season um, for Brighton. But yeah, both teams will be obviously looking for the win. But I think yeah, it'll be one draw. Yep. And uh, yourself, Henry, how, how do you see that one? Uh, how do you see that one playing out? I've got to say 2 1 to the Albion. I think that I think that Brighton will be able to get the win there. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff, good stuff. Well, we'll see what happens. I think um, I think it'll, it'll end up in a 2 2. I think there's definitely, uh, definitely. 
Thank you both for uh, for joining us. Great to uh, great to have you on. And you can catch up with all the latest sports news covering everything we've talked about today at sussexworld.co.uk. And you can watch more excellent videos on shotstv.com and Freeview Channel 276. But uh, for now, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for joining us again, guys.